the hell is going on? What's really going on? We said, what the hell happened? You don't have to know what the hell is on it. They, they see what's going on. I don't know what's going on. What is going on? We must find out what is going on. Hi, I'm Danielle Pletka. And I'm Mark Thiessen. Welcome to our podcast, What the Hell is Going On? Mark, what the hell is going on? Well, we've got a great guest today. We've got the Deputy Attorney General, Jeff Rosen, with us on the podcast to talk about uh, what's going on in the Justice Department. I've known Jeff for years since he was in working the White House Counsel's Office in the Bush administration, and I was uh, working there as a speechwriter, and uh, he's a really smart guy, lawyer's lawyer, and uh, he, we're going to talk about a lot of things, including the charge that's out there that uh, his boss, Attorney General Barr, is politicizing the Justice Department. There's a lot of people after Bill Barr. He's uh, not a popular attorney general with the left. In some ways, you have to feel everybody's pain who takes that job because, in fact, the left accuses Bill Barr of politicizing. But, in fact, the right accused Eric Holder of politicizing his job. The guy who said, "I'm, I'm Barack Obama's wingman. (laughs) <laughs> that one. <laughs> that one. That yes. one. And we can go back, and you and I both remember the unbelievable and disgraceful incident with Janet Reno where she went after this little Cuban refugee, Elian Gonzalez. Gonzalez, in a naked political act and shipped him back to live with Fidel Castro, which was so, you know, I think it's one of those jobs where one side hates you and the other side loves you. And yeah, the ship just turns on 180 degrees with each administration. Though I will tell you, I think it's so Barr was attorney general under George H.W. Bush and was a president who is having a moment, a little halo above his head. The left adores him so much. Well, and Barr had a halo above his head back then. He was considered just the the lawyer's lawyer, the Justice Department professional, consummate professional. And then he's come in now into the, it's sort of like the transformation of public perception of Dick Cheney from, you know, when he was uh, the secretary of defense under George H.W. Bush in the in the Persian Gulf War and then all of a sudden became Darth Vader when George W. Bush was in power. And, you know, the reality is, is that the left has their sights on this guy because he is actually having the temerity to investigate how did we get to the point that we spent two years and tens of millions of dollars and hampered a presidential administration for years over charges that he had, his campaign had colluded with Russia, which turned out to be 100 percent not the case. There was no evidence whatsoever. And now he has gone back and said, said, well, maybe we should find out how did this happen? How did this counterintelligence investigation start? Were any laws broken? Was there politicization in the process that led to this investigation? There's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of rocks that he is lifting that people don't want to be lifted. And so they're going after him personally and saying that this is all politicized. Well, I mean, I think he knew that when he took the job. I think his attitude, and if I recall correctly, we talked to John Yu about it on our podcast. And I think he said, you know, he's uh, he's an older man. He's done what he needed to do. He's done what he wanted to do. And he can take the incoming fire. Look, you know, we don't always obviously agree about all aspects of the Mueller affair. And I think that the Trump, first of all, the Trump campaign and even the president himself have been insufficiently mindful about the appearance of impropriety in terms of how they acted and talked about Russia. Um, And that was, you know, Flynn as well as others. But I will say this, and this is one thing I don't understand. I have a lot of liberal friends who have an enormous amount of integrity and have brought it to discussions on a whole variety of issues. You know, people who were outraged by the Obama administration's treatment of Syrian refugees, for example, or or the human rights scandals that occurred then and their total lack of interest. You would think that the same people would be horrified by the civil liberties violations that happened in the course of this Mueller investigation, Mm -hmm. because there but for the grace of God goes everyone. There but for the grace of God go they in a Republican administration that chose to, I don't know, you know, investigate whether Joe Biden has too close ties to China. Maybe Hunter Biden has some ties with that. You know, the failure to perceive that the undermining 
of our standards, of our mores, of our rule of law, and of people's civil freedoms by the Justice Department is something we ought to investigate because it will protect everybody going forward, not just Donald Trump. It will protect Joe Biden and Hunter Biden and everybody else who runs for president. This shouldn't happen. Agreed. Look, I think actually you and I probably agree much more about the Mueller probe than you think, because basically did candidate Donald Trump, putting aside all the things that he did as president, which I think we both agree he's been pretty tough on Russia, did Donald Trump have a absolutely horrible view of Russia and its role in the world and Vladimir Putin? Absolutely. Did he surround himself with people like Paul Manafort who were just icky uh, and had had relationships with oligarchs and, and Russian intelligence people that he should have never hired him? Of course he should have. But being wrong about Russia isn't a crime. It may be an intellectual crime. It's not an actual crime. And, you know, the idea that they would use the power of government to investigate a presidential campaign and then in the case of Flynn, who we both agree would, it was a terrible choice for national security advisor, bad judgment, you know, all the rest of it, you know, on Turkey, on Russia, on Putin, that they would try to entrap him after they had already discovered that Flynn had uh, been cleared in the what became the Mueller probe in the counterintelligence mm-hmm. investigation, but still went to interview him to see if they could get him to say something. This is not what should be happening in our government. This is not, we, it would be as outrageous if the Trump administration did that to the incoming Biden administration, if that right. happens, you know, but, it's just but, we should all be concerned as Americans about this abuse of power. This is part and parcel of the sort of bristling armed camps that you see on the left and the right, that we are incapable of having a conversation about things that should unite us. We're incapable of looking at the violence that broke out in the wake of George Floyd and other episodes of police crimes or police brutalities. We're incapable of looking at that and having a civil national conversation because the vast mass of Americans agree that, number one, not all police are represented by the guys who were responsible for George Floyd's death. Right? The vast mass of Americans actually want to see themselves protected by the police. The vast mass of Americans don't want their prosecutors and their DAs in their cities not to prosecute people for crimes. And yet we can't even have a conversation about this. On the one side, you've got DOJ being accused of fascism. And on the other side, you've got district attorneys and prosecutors who are going, eh, nah, I don't think that's a crime. It's okay. Well, the irony is also, Danny, is that, you know, the bar is accused of politicizing the Justice Department. You know, the Durham investigation, there have been no prosecutions except for one minor case. I mean, you know. Why is that? Because the Justice Department actually isn't politicized because basically Barr is letting Durham do his job and he's taking his time. Quite frankly, I'm concerned too much time in doing this because what I'm worried about is he's investigating the people who are going to come back into power if Joe Biden is elected, Right. And then all of a sudden, we the people who said that Attorney General Barr is interfering with prosecutions, all of a sudden might want to be tempted to interfere with Durham. It has nothing to do with the election, but I sure hope we get an answer from Durham before Inauguration Day if there's a transition of power, because we need to know what happened. Durham is the guy who investigated the CIA interrogation program under the Obama administration, under Eric Holder, and found, despite the predilections of the president and the attorney general, that there was nothing wrong done criminally by the CIA interrogation program. Well, he is not would, going to... That would be disqualifying in the eyes of a certain well, number sure. of people. I know, but he's not going to tell Bill Barr what he wants to hear. He's going to tell him what actually happened. And we need to have that information sooner rather than later. I keep lamenting the same thing, and I'm going to lament it again. I think our audience is already used to this. <laughs> <laughs> One might say the same of you, Mark! <laughs> Part of this, again, is, you know, I ask myself who out there in the American public says to themselves, yeah, what I really think should happen when we see uh, evidence of police brutality or when we see an arrest that's fumbled and somebody getting hurt, that what I really want to see happen is that all the stores around that place get brutalized and looted and that people's businesses get destroyed. You know, I mean, I'm sure there are some small fringe nut jobs who think that's the right way to express your anger about whatever happened. 
But of course, again, the mass of people don't feel that way. The mass of people do not feel that the right thing to do is to barge into the federal courthouse in your city if you're angry and start to tear it apart and burn things down. These are the people who represent you and try to keep you safe at the best of times. We are incapable of having a conversation. So the New York Times reports that, you know, outrage of outrages, the deputy attorney general, and we're going to ask him about this actually, says that we should use the Sedition Act to charge people, failing to bother to examine the fact that he doesn't want to accuse people of sedition. He wants to accuse people under the Sedition Act, which, which include provisions relating to attacks on federal buildings, right? So, you know, yeah, it's boring and complicated. And, you know, why do that when it's so much sexier to say that people are trying to overthrow the government and isn't Donald Trump a fascist? You, you know, why a question can't we have mark a normal... on that, which means you are, you're now verboten for uh, half of the country. Uh, well, you know. <laughs> Yeah, Is he I don't a fascist? Think, Seriously, no, Danny, are you asking that as a question? No, I'm, I'm not. It's a, it absolutely. I mean, <laughs> I, I who studied history know what a real fascist looks like. <laughs> well, let's talk to the guy who actually uh, was involved in that memo uh, that she cited on the Sedition Act, the Deputy Attorney General of the United States. Jeffrey A. Rosen is the 38th Deputy uh, Attorney General of the United States. He really does have an extraordinarily illustrious uh, resume. Mark, you called him a lawyer's lawyer, and truly, he was the Department of Justice's chief operating officer. He's a graduate of Harvard Law School. He was uh, Deputy Secretary of Transportation. He was general counsel and a senior policy advisor when you were at the White House under George W. Bush. You're going to love our conversation. Jeff, welcome to the podcast. Pleased to be here. Well, it's great to have you. So before we get into all the important issues at the Justice Department, you were one of the last people to argue a case in front of Ruth Bader Ginsburg before COVID came in and sort of stopped uh, in-person oral arguments. So tell us just a little bit about what that experience was like, what was the case, and uh, your thoughts uh, on her passing. Yeah, that was a memorable experience both at the time and even even more so now because I think there were maybe three or four arguments after the one uh, that I did in the end of February. And the case was uh, one about how many lawsuits prison inmates can file before, under the Prison Litigation Reform Act, it's enough is enough. (laughs) So there was a three strikes, you're out rule on how many they can file, basically. That's what the case was about. But uh, even though she was um, up there in years, I don't think she had lost anything mentally. She asked a lot of questions of both sides, actually. So, you know, now uh, that she's passed, you know, she will be remembered for her important role on the court as both an intellect and as the second woman justice. But that was a a memorable experience. And it's part of one of these uh, great traditions, actually, at the Justice Department. You know, ordinarily, the Justice Department is represented, the United States is represented by the Solicitor General. But there's this tradition that each attorney general and deputy attorney general sometime during their term argue one case on behalf of the United States. Oh, wow. So that was mine. And did you pick it or did? In consultation with the Solicitor General, you know, we have a discussion about which ones might make sense in terms of what are the government's interest and to be candid on I can't do one that's going to require a month of doing nothing else. (laughs) (laughs) You know, that the preparation has to be manageable. Right. Sure. It's remarkable, though, you know, when you have these conversations, it should remind everybody that all of the rhetoric about our democracy and our democracy being at risk and our democracy is teetering on the edge. And in fact, you know, our democracy, the, the Supreme Court, the Department of Justice, these things function, you know, smoothly and beautifully, despite the fact that the networks aren't in there watching them. People think of justices in the media on this sort of liberal conservative polarity thing. But there were... Just during the Obama years, 45 cases that were decided unanimously against the administration. So Justice Ginsburg, I think it's just over 45, but at least 45 times voted in a unanimous court. It wasn't polarized. It wasn't divided. They were 9-0. What unites us is more than what divides us. Well, Even in the Supreme Court, but that wasn't. But in fact, no. What you're referring to is something that has dropped down the memory hole, like so many other things in this day and age, which is that the Obama administration was very, very daring and very, very aggressive in its interpretation of executive power. I mean, if you remember the argument that there was about whether they could do recess appointments, and that was one of those decisions where they got smacked down nine to nothing. You know, no waffling on the part of the quote-unquote liberal justices in the Supreme Court. Right. So it's a good reminder that 
while there can be some blurry gray areas, there is a difference between law and politics. <laughs> Amen. Amen to that. Let's hope that we keep it that way. Um, and that's an issue that's happening right now where there's this huge debate over replacing Justice Ginsburg. Some Democrats are threatening that if the president goes ahead and confer and the Senate confirms his nominee, that uh, they may uh, expand the Supreme Court, pack the court uh, with justices to restore a liberal majority. They call it reform. Uh, I think they said as Senate Democrats even sent a letter to the court at one point when they were taking up a gun case last year threatening that if you take up this case, we may have to reform the court. I mean, is that appropriate? Well, I wouldn't call that reform. <laughs> <laughs> I think this, this, this actually harkens to, to uh, what I started with, actually, that, that not everything is law, but there's a lot of things that are traditions and institutions that we have relied on. And, you know, Franklin Roosevelt, at the peak of his powers, you know, right, our only president elected to four terms, at the peak of his power, tried to pack the courts and he failed, that the public and our institutions rejected that. So a lot of times we rely on the things that are extra legal but are part of our traditions. I think that's one of the things that's concerning to a lot of people right now is, is that our history and traditions, they're not perfect. We're always trying to improve them, obviously, trying to improve our institutions, trying to improve our laws, trying to improve how we do things. But they've worked really well for over 200 years, and uh, things should not be discarded cavalierly. So I have two things that I'm really eager to hear from you about. The first is, is something that uh, I think obviously we've been paying attention to over this summer of love uh, here in the United States of America, <laughs> and that is the question of what are being called by the Justice Department, quote, anarchist jurisdictions, unquote. So on the one side, the sort of no-holds-barred attitude on DOJ's side, and on the other side, this decision that selective enforcement of the law is, is a good thing. So this is actually something I've uh, both spoken and written about last year before some of the uh, more recent difficulties arose. I gave a speech at Wake Forest that was really about crime and, and the progressive DAs. And then I actually I had an op-ed in the Washington Post that I just happened to have brought for you. <laughs> and uh, it was at the time expressing concern about having people whose job it is to enforce the law, in that case, DAs, prosecutors, deciding not to ask the legislature to change the law, but to simply announce that whole categories of offenses would not be enforced. Sometimes uh, some of these social reform DAs say, not going to prosecute as felonies any thefts or larcenies under $1,500. Not going to prosecute certain uh, people who are immigrants because it might have immigration consequences to prosecute them. Not going to prosecute what the DA in San Francisco calls quality of life crimes, as in people uh, publicly urinating and otherwise. Good to know that's a quality of life crime. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what he called it. That's what the... Yeah. And they've created whole categories where they've just said they're not going to enforce the law. Well, ordinarily, A, we think legislatures are supposed to do that on behalf of their citizens. If they want to say that we're going to decriminalize certain drug possession or, or certain other offenses, that is normally and appropriately done through the people's representatives. The other part is what's the practical consequence? If you announce up front that people are not going to be prosecuted for thefts and larcenies, what do we think is going to happen? The uh, incidents. So we have a lot of 1499 thefts and larcenies <laughs> as opposed to $1,500, right? Yeah. <laughs> so last fall, I started raising the concern that what's going to happen to the crime rate? Because one of the things that's not been much articulated or, or addressed is the last two years of the Obama administration, the rates of violent crime in particular had increased pretty significantly. In my recollection is murders were up 20%. We changed some of the policies uh, at the federal level, but the federal is only part of the, the situation because there's much more state and local partnership than federal personnel. And in 2017, 2018, and 2019, violent crime rates decreased. Is that going to continue? That's the challenge. And the state and local. Apparently is, not. <laughs> as I said, the state and locals, there's many, many more local law enforcement, state, local, tribal, and other local than there are federal. I was initially raising the concern about these social reform DAs not enforcing the law, and what was that going to do? Didn't see at that time in the fall of last year, pandemics and civil unrest and rioting. <laughs> those those were not not what I was uh, initially concerned about. But it's all 
all goes into the same set of uh, phenomena. Well, we just had a, uh, court, a Supreme Court case basically affirming the Obama administration's selective prosecution with DACA. Uh, that the you know the president basically this is the this same is thing. Literally, what I was about yeah. to ask you about. <laughs> this is the same. We just had John Yu on on the podcast a few weeks ago, and you know the, basically President Obama just said, "Well, I'm just not going to enforce some of the immigration laws because I don't like." And as you say, that's that's the role of the legislature, and the Supreme Court basically said, "Well." President Trump didn't follow the Administrative Procedures Act correctly, so therefore he has to continue enforcing this DACA provision. And so John's response is, well, then okay, then he could, if you can do that on immigration, you can do it on anything. You could do it on taxes, you can do it, you know, he can just, President just can have a tax cut. Just tell the IRS we're not going to be enforcing uh, tax collection. You know, the, the, is this a slippery slope we're heading down? Well, you know, look, cases do depend on their specific facts sometimes, too. In the DACA case, the Supreme Court didn't actually say that DACA was lawful or had to be preserved. And in fact, the earlier incarnation, the DAPA non-enforcement policy, I think it's the Fifth Circuit, had said was actually unlawfully done and a divided 4-4 Supreme Court when Justice Scalia had mm -hmm. not there and had not been replaced, had affirmed it. So I don't know if John Yu addressed the particulars. I don't want to comment on his analysis because I, I haven't read it. But I don't read the Supreme Court case as saying that the non-enforcement policy in DACA is permanently there. I think there's legal authority to change that. Are we going to? Well, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first, people. I, let's see. I, no, no, I think I, I, I think I was, I was thinking of a phrase I've, I've heard somewhere before. Uh, let's see what happens. This year, I'm not, <laughs> not sure I want to see what happens. Honestly, I, I can't imagine what's next. But I guess just on a broader sense. I can't see our way out of this growing divide of the selective enforcement question of the attrition uh, against the rule of law. And I say this and I mean it, and this is not something that goes for the left. You know, what goes around comes around. And I can see that spiraling into some sort of a disastrous situation. How do we get back on track? So, you know, the question of selective non-enforcement is really actually a very complicated one. I think what I objected to on the social reform DAs was complete wholesale, just saying, see this law that's on the books, I'm just going to wholesale not do it. There's always a certain amount of discretion that's needed, prosecutorial discretion or administrative enforcement discretion, whatever the case may be, because there are not always the resources, nor does it always make sense to pursue everything to the nth degree. So there's always a certain amount of, we're going to let this one go or it's not worth pursuing. It's when it's a calculated policy judgment that just says this isn't a matter of administering or enforcing the laws using available resources, but rather a policy judgment to supersede the legislature and not do that. And I think of it a little bit like the battle we've seen in the courts over the years of what's the role of judges, what's the role of enforcement officials, prosecutors, civil litigators, etc. And at least the conservative perspective has generally been, for example, the courts, the role is somewhat like umpires of faithfully implementing the law, calling it straight whether you would have personally favored the law or disfavored the law. And some on the other side of the equation have favored more of a results-oriented calculus. With regard to how do we get back then, your question is how do we get back to something in the government side of things, the Justice Department or other enforcement agencies, it's partly a matter of having people that believe in that ethos and pursuing a culture that says that's the right way to do things. It's persuasion. Attorney General Barr has been accused by his critics of politicizing the Justice Department, inserting himself into all sorts of prosecutions and uh, putting his thumb on the scale and being the president's lawyer as opposed to the American people's lawyer. What do you say to that? It's wrong. <laughs> that's, where, that's where I start, <laughs> is, is there's a number of pieces of that puzzle. I mean, first of all, at the Department of Justice, we do things based on the facts and the law. And that's especially true in investigations, prosecutions, and litigation, which is a special subcategory of because the department does do other things. I mean, like any big government cabinet department, it does other things. But in the realms of investigations and prosecutions in particular, we do things on the facts and the law, and if someone just thinks about the math, there are tens of thousands of cases, and there's over 100,000 employees. So the idea that that would be politicized 
First of all, the math doesn't even work. But second, it's just wrong. The only time, because what does politicization mean? It means outside efforts to influence the decisions on something other than the merits. And the only time I've ever seen that is congressional efforts to say, you shouldn't investigate this or you should investigate that. And uh, I think those two, if we receive that kind of thing, we just assess it on the merits. What are the facts? What, are, what does somebody have to say? So I think it's wrong at that level. I would say this question of, is the Justice Department politicized, has come up in every administration for decades. Certainly people said that about Attorney General Holder, but it was raised uh, with uh, the Attorney Generals in the Bush years, Ashcroft, and before that. You know, each time you have to ask, what is the basis for the charge? But all Attorney Generals do have a role in addition to being the head prosecutor. They are an advisor to the president. They are a policymaker. They make recommendations to Congress on legislation. In those areas, it's perfectly appropriate to be involved in policy. And sometimes I think that gets confused with, well, if your position is we should change this law or that law, that means you're political. Well, no, that's totally appropriate. It's just you have to faithfully, on the, on the investigations and prosecutions, implement the law that Congress wrote, even if you would have changed it. I think the other complicating factor is... As the law starts to carry more freight, as, as we see things in the courts that seem like to the public as political issues, the courts are deciding major public policy questions, and the advocate for the United States is on one side or the other. And either way, the public's going to perceive that as political. But that's not actually how the decisions are made. I think the attorney general himself has said that the department that he's running today is not the same department that he ran uh, in the Bush 41 administration, in fact, and that a lot of – there's a lot of politicization that happened that it seems to be trying to depoliticize. I mean you just look into the entire counterintelligence investigation into the Trump campaign, the treatment of Michael Flynn, the, all of these things. It seems to me like he's trying to depoliticize it by digging – rooting that out and finding out what happened. Is that fair? Well, I think it is fair to say, almost going back to where I started, that if you want things to be done based on their factual and legal merits – and you don't want them done on either outside political interference, but you also don't want individuals bringing their political views, uh, whether it's at the FBI in 2016 or, or anywhere else. So let me ask you about this question of sedition. You've gotten a lot of flack for it. A lot, a lot of flack. So I'm going to give you some more that. just so you feel I, good about it. I didn't it. catch that. There was? <laughs> there was. I'm just, I'm just doing my job. Uh, New York Times reported in September that you had recommended that the government consider those charges. Now, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but I think of sedition as an effort to overthrow the government. So what the Justice Department did to Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not allowed to hit Mark in front of these. these <laughs> they can't with, see. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Listeners can't see. Listeners can't. No, I know, but he's got security with oh, him okay. if I see, beat I'm you safe. up. <laughs> so I'm, unlike most podcasts, I'm safe. But, uh, yes. There we go. But they won't be here forever, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, so, you know, look, I think anytime there's something like this that's controversial, anytime that the Justice Department makes a decision that, you know, that appears to people to be potentially going over the top, it's very, it's a great idea to actually give people the opportunity to discuss it openly and to explain why it is that you thought that this was a good idea. So we take a half step back. We were dealing with some civil unrest situations, Portland in particular, where the cooperation state and local was not the excellent relationship that we see in most parts of the country. So, <laughs> That's an understatement. So, <laughs> you're such a good diplomat. Maybe you're Very not supposed temperate. to be the State Department. <laughs> so so I, I think the question was, in thinking about the federal role and the federal assistance, what can we do? And so this particular thing is something of a, you know, a leak of, of internal deliberation. So I don't want to get you know, too detailed. But given what's already out there and that I think my memo's out there. We regularly actually did this with regard to COVID-related crimes, frauds and fake cures and stuff like that. Look at, well, what are the federal laws that potentially apply and that prosecutors can consider? We, we're not saying make this particular charge independent of the facts or something. We're saying, okay, in a situation, what particular laws might apply? So I noticed uh, the, the memo I did last week has found its way onto the internet. 
And uh, if you look at it, there's Speaking a, of politicization, by the way, not just a one-way street. The list of charges in the memo is six or seven for consideration as to do they fit the facts and situation of any given case. You know, they vary. The sedition thing seemed to have attracted a lot of attention, but it's really because of the title. The point that I made was there are provisions in that that are not about conspiracy to overthrow the government. As the memo says, because it's, it's on the internet, it talks about use of force to do violence against a federal building. And while that may not sound to people like, well, that's sedition, I can't help what the, the title of the section is. There's multiple parts of the statute, and some of them can be considered if they're applicable. Nothing in, the, in that memo or in any earlier discussions arbitrarily says you must make this charge or that charge. It just says here's some statutes that purport to uh, address situations that could be applicable. And that, that's just kind of basic legal work is what law may apply and then does it or doesn't it in a particular situation for the people that are looking at that. Just to demonstrate the point that I am making, though, there's another memo that is on the Internet as well, although the, uh, this other one we posted on the COVID response section of the DOJ website, uh, some guidance to our U.S. attorneys on available charges with regard to COVID-related fraud. And uh, it's extremely similar, actually. It's a three-page memo, and it's to uh, the, the litigating divisions and the United States attorneys, uh, Department of Justice Enforcement Actions Related to COVID-19. And it mentions some some schemes and things that have been reported, sales of fake testing kits, cures, immunity pills, phishing emails asking for money, fake COVID-19 uh, websites that actually install malware. And then the memo just canvases some of the available statutes that can be considered. They may or may not apply in a given case. And I, I remember there was a similar kind of flap because one of the ones is a statute that's about bioterrorism. And the title, again, makes people think, well, how, what would that have to do with anything? But the statute covers... More than uh, bioterrorism. Exactly, because it covers certain use of chemicals, use of biological agents for hoaxes. So, again, the words of the statute may or may not fit a situation. You can't just go by the title, because Congress sometimes will put a title for one thing, but have four subparts. Right, of course. Well, let's, let's, let me ask you then about what some people say is an, is an investigation into another form of sedition, which is the Durham investigation. There's a lot of information out there from the IG report and others about misconduct within the FBI, within the Justice Department related to uh, the investigation of the president. Glenn Simpson uh, lied to Congress about his meetings with Bruce Orr. Christopher Steele lied to and defrauded the FBI. The only person who's been prosecuted so far is Kevin Kleinsmith, this uh, relatively junior person uh, who provided false information to the advisor court. You know, with the elections coming up, the possible transition of power is coming up. Are we going to get any closure on the Durham investigation or is this going to just drag on? So with regard to a pending investigation, I'm sure you appreciate that I'm pretty constrained in what I can, I can say. Sure. I probably have to refer you to any remarks the attorney general has publicly made. But kind of a, a couple of thoughts. That are, say, let's on the subject, but are not about the investigation. One is, you alluded to a good amount of information, and I, I sometimes talk about how much information is available in plain sight, because the Inspector General, Michael Horowitz is the Inspector General for the Justice Department, did this, you know, very lengthy report in De December of last year, 434 pages. And I've been really uh, surprised at how little of it seems to me I, to have worked its way into the press. Obviously, I don't... You mean read. the New York Times isn't interested? <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> there's a lot of information. And, and the reason I start with that is I think in the big picture, in thinking about accountability of when, when something goes wrong, there are lots of different ways that this comes to pass in terms of public understanding. And I think the other thing that has surprised me a little bit on this is that there was a time when civil liberties kind of cut across the spectrum that everybody was interested in it. And you're probably too young to remember this, but uh, when I was in high school and college, there were these church and pike committees in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard much discussion of those, but back then, the Senate was the church committee and the House was the pike committee. 
And they did these big investigations about what they perceived to be civil liberties abuses, particularly in the 1960s, of the CIA and FBI. And the FBI part is kind of interesting because uh, I pulled out some of the old part in the church committee. And, you know, 1964, the FBI was used to cover the Atlantic City Democratic Convention and provide surveillance information back to the Johnson White House. And this has all been like forgotten to history. But these reports, you know, here's, I can leave you the, the reference, are out there. And when that was reported, people were extremely concerned. And it wasn't just, you know, surveillance of that. There were lots of other episodes, including some that are more famous, like the surveillance of Martin Luther King. And I think, you know, what's the Santayana uh, statement? Those who uh, fail to uh, learn from history are destined to repeat it. Mm -hmm. It's important that some of this information that's out there be assessed, not in a some kind of uh, partisan way, but just fundamentally of how do we want our institutions to function. It is absolutely remarkable how capable we have become of dropping things down the memory hole because the predations of the FBI were notorious and there were reforms that were put in place, but you do not want to live in a country where federal bureaucrats, whether they're policemen or they're tax collectors, are empowered to act on their political whims. Because, you know, this is what Mark and I have been saying again and again over the last few weeks, because what goes around comes around. You know, if it's going to be used by one side, guess what, guys? It's going to be used by the other. I don't want to let you go before I ask you about the question of foreign interference. Sure. I know you have a, uh, the FBI has a foreign election interference task force, but can you just talk about how much of a danger you think this is? You know, yes, we've gotten better, but the bad guys have gotten better too. You know, I know I know who the Chinese are voting for. I know who the Russians are voting for. I know who the Iranians are voting for. Kim Jong-un hasn't updated me on who he's voting for. But all of these guys have a but finger in the... But you're voting for. <laughs> <laughs> but all of these guys have a finger in the pie, and it is worrying. So by happenstance, I gave some public remarks about this subject on August 26th that are available on the DOJ website. Uh, both, we'll link to them. We'll link to them. Yeah, both, both the text and, and there's a video. And what I distinguish between, because I, I think it is a matter of concern, the malign foreign influence efforts, is between things that actually affect the hardware of voting. The voting machines affected, uh, are the voter registration lists affected, are the voting systems secure from the other issue of are people trying to influence our elections through either propaganda, deception, uh, coercion, lots of different ways. And the good news was that as to 2016 and 2018, all the assessments that have been done say that there was no problem with the actual voting machinery in terms of the vote totals. No vote totals were changed. There's a separate question about these efforts at malign influence efforts. And that has gone on for a very long time. The Soviets used to try to do things like that. And you said the French did it to Jefferson. I, yes, in the, in the remarks that I offered, I talk about how in the election of 1796, the French ambassador published uh, threats in the Philadelphia newspapers that they wanted Jefferson to win, and they threatened that if he didn't, they would threaten uh, U.S. merchant ships and make it uh, difficult for uh, put Americans' uh, wealth at risk. Totally backfired, of course. I bet France would like to do that again. Had <laughs> 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 uh, been uh, one of these things that's only recently been reminded people of, but. Both Jefferson and Adams have, have written about it subsequently. So at, at some level, this goes back a long way. But there's some new dimensions, which I think is what you're getting at, which is the technology of deceptive influence efforts different than in the past, in, in part because of the Internet and especially social media, but technologies, deep, deep fakes and other things that are not as easy to figure out as some of the frauds of the past that the Soviets and the Nazis and others where they planted stuff in the United States. So it's a concern and try to be very careful about staying on top of it. Have you been tougher on, uh, for example, Russia than the previous administration? Because the previous administration knew that this was happening and sort of held its fire. President Trump, as I got him to admit to me in a, in a published interview, so you can talk about it now, he launched a cyber attack on the Internet Research Agency. 
uh, in St. Petersburg, which is the troll farm that was spreading all this in- disinformation. So, you know, where was that cyber attack under under Obama? So, you know, in the in the remarks uh, a few weeks ago, one of the things I talked about was that the administration implemented sanctions against Russia for the 2016, and again, further sanctions in the last 12 months for Ru- Russia's influence operations. Another one of those things you don't read a lot about, but the administration has been very tough. And we know the Intelligence Committee's assessment is that Russia want, still wants Donald Trump to win, but they've also assessed that China wants Joe Biden to win. What is China up to? The uh, Office of the Director of National Intelligence issued what I think you're alluding to, the uh, election threat update, they kind of set out what China's up to, what Russia's up to, what Iran was up to. I can't really do better. China assessments available online. Here's what it says. We assess that China prefers that President Trump, who Beijing sees as unpredictable, does not win re-election. China has been expanding its influence efforts ahead of November 2020 to shape the policy environment in the United States, pressure political figures it views as opposed to China's interest, and deflect and counter criticism of China. Beijing recognizes that all these efforts might affect the presidential race. Don't hear much about that. Well, we did hear. I mean, we heard that Beijing had a had a different preference. I think the issue here is that, you know, the Russia question has had such legs over the course of the Trump presidency that there's a real echo chamber that's been built and that just continues to work ar- around that. But of course, Iran is also very eager for Trump to lose, given everything that's happened during the Trump administration. And they have become, you know, they are obviously the victims of, of cyber attacks, but they've also become pretty adept themselves at trying to move the needle the uh, statement I was referencing is from uh, NCSC Director William Avenina. It's on the Director of National Intelligence's website, so it's publicly available. Well, we could keep you here all day and ask you questions, but I know you've got a, a busy job, so we're grateful to you for taking the time out to, uh, to talk to us. Thanks a ton. Pleased to be here, and uh, thanks for having me. So, Danny, are we going to have a peaceful transition of power? You know, I mean, I don't know if we're going to have a transition at all. We may end up with Donald Trump being reelected. I've got to say, the popularity of the notion, which we can all blame Donald Trump for, actually, that, and it's true, this notion that elections are rigged. He has said it, and it was parroted by Hillary Clinton, and now it's been parroted by every two-bit, you know, Democrat out there. It's worrisome. You want people to have faith in the outcome of our elections, and listening to Jeff Rosen you feel like, yeah, they're working really hard to ensure that you know there's not foreign interference, that our systems are secure, that people can vote. I just can't help but feel like somebody's going to just try to put into question what happens no matter who gets elected. Well, sure, because the Russia investigation was the way to call into question Trump's legitimacy. And now the new Russia will be... Uh, China. You know, well, no, because China wants Trump to uh, wants Trump to lose. Right. Uh, you know what? They, oh, you mean if, 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 if Trump, you mean if he loses? If, yeah. if Donald Trump wins, then the new thing will be, uh, you know, suppression of the vote and mail in balloting and all and voter. You know, the irony is, is that you know they keep running around screaming, Donald Trump won't say that he'll accept the election results. We could have a milit- We could have a coup. Will they drag him out of the Oval Office? Or, you know, with an armed guard and all this other stuff. The people most likely to challenge the validity of the election are the Democrats, because I think something like 60 percent of the mail-in ballots are Democratic votes. And the mistake Trump makes about this is he talks about voter fraud. It's about voter failure. These ballots, putting aside any fraud, any nefarious activity, mail-in ballots fail at like a 21 percent rate on average. So there's going to be 21 percent of those votes or some such is not going to get counted because you didn't fill it out right. They didn't. The signature doesn't match. They didn't. They they didn't have postmark it correctly, and so they're going to scream around saying that Trump stole the election. It's going to be the opposite of what they're what they're saying that, that Trump is not going to accept the election results. It's going to be the left and, and you know they're the people who gave us not my president. Uh, we're just going to have a different excuse and uh, if he wins again. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> It ain't okay. get better, Danny. Oh my lord! And I never remember <laughs> two thousand. I remember two thousand with such horror. Well, if you have nothing else, you've got our podcasts to look forward to. Because yeah, I'm really not. Looking no matter what to happens, you're gonna want to know what the hell is going on. Exactly. <laughs> well said. Perfect Madison Avenue. Thanks, guys. Remember, send your ideas my way. Send your complaints Mark's way, and send any technical complaints to Alexa. <laughs> Take care. And our team here at AEI is Alexa Santry, Matt Weinset, Jen Moretta, and Macy Heath. Let us know what topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing us at whatthehell at AEI.org. 
Or you can reach us on Twitter. I'm at D. Pletka. And I'm at Mark Thiessen. That's Mark with a C. Please rate and review the podcast. If you like the show, please subscribe, share it, comment on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening to this. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.